All right, welcome to our lecture on the tree of life and the classification of living things. This goes along with chapters 14 and 15.1 of Biology the Essentials by Hofnagel. Our objectives with this lecture are to demonstrate an understanding of the tree of life as a scientific hypothesis, accounting for the development and evolution of life on Earth. You should be able to describe spontaneous generation and biogenesis, explain the experiments of historical significance in supporting spontaneous generation and biogenesis, and list three methods used to distinguish species from one another. You should also be able to demonstrate an understanding of classification and evolution of organisms. You should be able to list the domains of organisms and the major characteristics of members in each of those three domains. You should be able to classify living organisms into the correct kingdoms for each domain and describe the scientific method for naming organisms. You should also be able to explain the difference between taxonomy and phylogeny. All right, so let's start with the debate over spontaneous generation. It's been around for a while. Aristotle first proposed the theory of spontaneous generation. Um, as a hypothesis that living organisms arise from non-living matter, that some vital force forms life. The conflicting theory to spontaneous generation is biogenesis, and biogenesis is the hypothesis that living organisms arise from pre-existing life. In the 1600s, almost 2,000 years after Aristotle, Francesco Redi did this experiment. So he filled three jars with decaying meat. He left one open to the air, one he sealed, and one he covered with a fine mesh. So you can see, of course, rotting meat is going to attract flies, right? So the unsealed flask has flies and maggots on the meat. The sealed jar has neither. And the flask covered with gauze has attracted flies, and there are maggots on the gauze at the top. Oops, sorry. So maggots, if you didn't know, are larval flies or baby flies. Um, so what we see here is that when the flies have access to the rotting meat, they're able to lay their eggs, and of course the larvae that hatch are able to feed on that meat and thrive right? If it's sealed, the flies can't access the meat, they don't lay their eggs, and they're probably oblivious that there's even meat in the jar, right? But over here with the gauze, the flies can smell the food, but they can't get to the food. So they lay their eggs on the gauze here, but when their larvae hatch from the eggs, the maggots have nothing to feed on, so they shrivel up and die. And this was important evidence because it shows that life, the maggots, the next generation of flies, have to come from the flies being able to access the meat. If spontaneous generation were true, then you'd expect there to be larva, larval flies down here inside the sealed jar, which we don't see. So life begets life. This experiment supports biogenesis. You can't get baby flies without adult flies to lay those eggs. And the larvae need food to grow, right? So Reddy's experiment was important and it helped us differentiate between spontaneous generation and biogenesis, what's actually happening. Um, the first evidence of microbial life uh, came later, or about the same time actually, but slightly later, when Anton van Leeuwenhoek developed the first microscopes. And this allowed scientists to see for the first time cells. In the 1700s, John Needham put boiled nutrient broth, so picture like chicken broth, into covered flasks kind of like ready sealed flask with the meat, right? And so the broth was heated and then placed into the sealed flask. Boiling was thought by some to kill all life. 
However, microbes grew in that boiled broth. All right, in the later 1700s, Lazaro Spilazzani did another experiment, and he criticized Needham's study, suggesting that microbes from the air had entered his flasks. So he boiled nutrient solutions in flasks and then immediately sealed them. Critics said that air is needed for life. But from Spilazzani's experiment, the nutrient broth was heated in a flask and immediately sealed, and no microbial growth occurred the broth remained clear. Oops, sorry. So Spellanzani's work showed that um, if we can keep the air out, uh, which might have microbes in it, then we can prevent growth. So if we can keep the living organisms from being able to access this broth, then they can't produce more living cells, right? So this is further evidence in favor of biogenesis and against spontaneous generation. If spontaneous generation were true, then where there's the food in good growing conditions, living things should appear, right? And of course, that's not what Spellinsani sees. In the 1800s, Louis Pasteur demonstrated that microorganisms are present in the air, and this is the final nail in the coffin for spontaneous generation. Pasteur set up experiments with swan neck flasks. So these were flasks, basically glass vessels that had long curved neck to them, and then a container that held a larger volume of broth. So he had um, his swan neck flasks, and if he kept the flask upright so that no air could enter and access the broth, there's no microbial growth. But when the flask is tilted, dust from the bend in the neck seeped back into the flask, which made the infusion or the broth cloudy with microbes within a day. So Louis Pasteur's work showing that when air is present, microbes can grow, and when air is absent, they do not grow in the boiled broth. And, and this is the final experiment that makes it obvious that biogenesis is what's actually happening, and spontaneous generation is simply not true. Ah, here's a good picture. I knew I had one. All right, so for Pasteur's experiment, to disprove the theory of spontaneous generation, he poured beef broth into a long necked flask, and there were microbes present in this broth. Next, he heated the neck of the flask and bent it into an S shape. This is the swan neck part of the flask. Microbes were not present in the broth after the liquid is boiled. So here's the Bunsen burner. He's applying heat to the broth and boiling it. And we can see there are no microbes in the solution after it cooled, even after long periods of time have passed, days or weeks. The bend in the neck prevented microbes, I'm sorry, from entering the flask, right? Air from the outside or microbes in the air can't make it through these two curves and into the broth. So microbes weren't present in here, so the broth would remain clear. Okay, however, in the neck of the flask, there would be a small amount of broth, and the broth here in the neck that's exposed to the air where microbes could fall in, this part does spoil and become cloudy with microbial growth. So the whole point of this experiment is it shows that if air is able to get to the broth, then the bacteria that's in the air can grow in the broth. But if we prevent microbes in the air from being able to access the broth, then nothing will grow in this broth here in the flask. All right, so spontaneous generation debate led to the development of the scientific method. Observations leads to questioning. Questions generate hypotheses. Hypotheses are tested by experimentation, 
and results can disprove a hypothesis or support it. Accepted hypotheses after enough experiments build up a large, overwhelming, consistent database of evidence in support of a hypothesis, it can become a theory or a law. Or you might need to reject or modify your hypothesis. All right, so now that we know that living cells only come to be or only arise from other living cells, let's talk about how those cells become different species. So what is a species? Well, in evolution, new species form and species can also become extinct. Species are distinct groups of organisms, but the definition of the word species has changed over time. Small evolutionary changes that accumulate in a population are called microevolution, and these can occur quickly in just a few generations. Eventually, this leads to macroevolution, which is slower and results from larger scale changes. Now, Linnaeus classified species based on their appearance. So in the 1700s, Carlos Linnaeus created a naming scheme for species that's still used today. Each species name combines with a broader classification of genus with the most specific species. So there's a two part name for every living thing, genus and species, like humans are homo sapiens. Now uh, the biological species define species by their ability to reproduce. So modern biologists use the biological species concept to define species based on their ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. New species form when some individuals can no longer interbreed with the rest of the group. Now, some species can't be defined by reproduction, though. Asexually reproducing species and species represented only by fossils never interbreed. Some organisms have potential to interbreed, but don't do so in nature. And reproductive isolation isn't always absolute, especially in plants. So sometimes we need to turn to genetic analyses to define species based on their DNA. Researchers compare the nucleotide sequences of genes that organisms have in common. If the DNA of two organisms is more than 97% identical, they're considered the same species. All right, so what do you think? The biological species concept can't be applied to which groups of organisms? Good, extinct organisms, because we don't know what can breed together and what couldn't. All right, how does the biological species concept differ from Linnaeus's definition of the term species? Well, Linnaeus defines species based on their appearance. Biological species definition is based on whether or not they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And there are such things as cryptic species or two species that look exactly the same, but actually don't interbreed or can't produce fertile offspring. So these are often the same, but not always. Biological classification systems are based on common descent or evolutionary history. Biolo biologists try to organize all species into a classification system that reflects evolutionary history. And we do that by breaking things down into taxonomic groups, like domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And you can see here for this aloe vera plant, the scientific name is its genus aloe and its species vera. So the scientific name for this organism is aloe vera. Taxonomy is the science of describing, naming, and classifying species. It, the most inclusive or largest taxon is the domain, and the least inclusive or the most specific is the species part. So as you work your way down this chart from domain, kingdom, phylum, down to genus and species, the number of species in each category or each level gets smaller and smaller as you go down. All life can be sorted into one of three domains, 
domain bacteria, domain archaea, and these two together encompass all prokaryotic life, and domain eukarya, which is separate. So domain bacteria contain bacteria like E. coli, lactobacillus, acidophilus, staphylococcus aureus, and archaea. These are single-celled organisms that like to live in extreme environments like methanogens and the rumens of cattle or organisms that live in the hot springs of Yellowstone. All prokaryotes, so organisms in both domain bacteria and domain archaea, these are all single-celled organisms. They lack a membrane-bound nucleus, so their DNA is just contained within their cell membrane, but there's not a special organelle that holds the DNA. And in fact, they lack all membrane-bound organelles altogether. Now, the third domain, eukaryota, or eukarya, this contains single and multi-celled organisms. They all have a membrane-bound nucleus, and they also contain organelles that are membrane-bound. Some examples of organisms in domain eukarya are plants, animals, fungi, and protists like euglena. They'll be looked at in the lab. Each domain is further subdivided into kingdoms. So we'll talk first about domain bacteria includes only one kingdom and that's kingdom bacteria. So bacteria are those single celled organisms. They have a cell wall, but they do not have organelles or an organized nucleus. Some are helpful producing vitamins or food. Others are harmful and can cause disease. So make sure you wash your hands before you eat so you don't pick up anything you didn't want. All right, domain archaea includes only one kingdom, also named archaea. So these two are simple. Bacteria and archaea domains each include a single kingdom that shares their same name. So archaea are single-celled organisms without a nucleus that have the ability to live through all sorts of extreme conditions and temperatures. Single-celled organisms are so small you can't see them without a microscope. All right, and then the other four kingdoms all belong within domain eukaryota, and that includes kingdom animalia, plantae, fungi, and protista. All right, so what are the characteristics of kingdom animalia? Well, animals include vertebrates, or sorry, invertebrates like insects and vertebrates like mammals and birds. Six important aspects of animals are that they're multicellular, which means they have many cells. They do not have cell walls. They consume food. They're heterotrophic. Uh, and all animals reproduce sexually. Animals are, most animals reproduce sexually, we should say that. Um, animals are able to move at some time during their life, and they have a nervous system and respond to the things that they sense around them. Kingdom plantae in domain eukaryota are also multicellular. Uh, plant cells have cell walls and unique organelles called chloroplasts. Plants produce food through a process called photosynthesis. They usually can't move because they're rooted in place. Uh, plants reproduce sexually or asexually, and some reproduce with seeds through pollinations, others through spores, or even asexually as rhizomes or tubers. Kingdom fungi in domain eukaryota are multicellular decomposers like mold, moss, and mushrooms, but a few of them can be single-celled like yeast. Fungi digest their food outside themselves and then absorb it, and this process decomposes dying things and turns them into useful things like soil. They do not produce food through photosynthesis like plants do, so they don't need any light. The kingdom fungi was formerly known as monera. So if you're looking at older resources or textbooks, videos, movies, field guides, you might see monera listed. Monera has been replaced with fungi.
Domain eukaryota includes kingdom protista. Protista has the sound T in it and has such a variety of organisms that fit into one pot or kingdom, that is. Most are single-celled organisms, but have many cells like algae. Protista have a nucleus, organelles, and sometimes chloroplasts. Some can move with little hair-like things called cilia or something like a tail called flagella. They get their food either through photosynthesis like plants or by ingestion like animals, and some can do both. Each successive level of taxonomy is further subdivided into increasingly specific groupings. So prokaryotes or eukaryotes, domains, kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And the mnemonic device I use to help remember these are do keep ponds clean or frogs get sick. And here's some examples. So we've got domain eukarya includes all these different organisms in it. Kingdom animalia includes these things. Phylum is limited to these. So we're going down to try and figure out how do we classify pongo abeli? How do we how do we classify this organism here? So as we go down, we're getting more and more specific. There are fewer and fewer organisms that fit in each group, right? All right. So phylum chordata, so everything that has a backbone, class mammalia, they have fur and nurse their young, order primates. Family Hominidae, genus Pongo, and species Pongo abeli. So as we go down from domain to species, we get more and more specific, and there's fewer organisms in each group. All right, taxonomy organizes species into groups and is how biologists give unique names to everything. Modern taxonomy was started with the work of Linnaeus, and the more features two organisms have in common, the more taxonomic levels they share. Oops. However, taxonomic groups were developed before biologists understood evolutionary relationships. And this is where phylogenetics comes in, or cladistics. These two words are synonyms. Our textbook, I think, uses cladistics, um, but you'll see phylogenetics on other things. So it's important to understand that these two words are synonymous. They mean the same thing. Phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary relationships and is based on shared derived traits. This means traits that were inherited from ancestors. Phylogenetics distinguishes between traits that are ancestral or inherited and traits that are derived or not inherited from an ancestor. All right. For example, the last common ancestor of all mammals had mammary glands and hair. And we know this is true because all mammals have mammary glands and hair. Next, we have giving birth to live young. So platypus does not give birth to live young, but everything downstream from this point does. These are ancestral characters for placental mammals. These are features that are present in the ancestors of placental mammals, and these features may also be present in monotremes or marsupials. Derived characters for placental mammals are features of placental mammals that are different from those in other mammals, and they arose after the split between placental and marsupial organisms. Phylogenies, or cladograms, are diagrams showing these evolutionary relationships, and the phylogeny is a tool used to develop hypotheses about the relationships between groups of organisms. So the hypothesis here would be that birds and non-avian dinosaurs are more closely related than birds and crocodiles, right? Because the difference distance from this note or this tip 
to this one is less than the distance from birds to crocodiles, right? So distance on a phylogeny is related to how closely related things are. Shorter distances are organisms that are more closely related, and the longer the distance, the more distantly related those organisms are. Phylogenies consist of clades, and a clade is a group of organisms consisting of a common ancestor and all its descendants. Birds, dinosaurs, and crocodiles have a common ancestor way back here, and that makes them a clade. Another way I like to think about clades is, is this, if this is a tree, an evolutionary tree, if you were to prune it and snip off right here, everything that falls off when you make one cut on an evolutionary tree would be a clade. <clears throat> Looks like I need to make my image a little smaller here. All right, so phylogenies emphasize evolutionary relationships and physical similarities between organisms, which can result from convergent evolution, are not the focus of phylogenetics. So convergent evolution would be something like um, birds and bats both have wings, right? But that the wings of a bird and the wings of a bat, which is a mammal, are different from each other, and that's not a trait that was shared by their common ancestor. So that would be a convergent trait, and that's not the focus of the relationships displayed here. Common ancestors indicate evolutionary relatedness. Birds and dinosaurs have a common ancestor, making them a clade. They're more closely related to each other than they are to crocodiles. Birds, dinosaurs, and crocodiles have an even older common ancestor, which makes them a larger clade. Reptiles do not form a clade. Linnaean class Reptilia includes turtles, lizards, snakes, and crocodiles, and the extinct dinosaurs, but it excludes birds. But birds are in the same clade with reptiles based on their many shared char shared derived characteristics. Endotherms do not form a clade. So birds and mammals are endotherms because they maintain a constant body temperature. However, their last common ancestor could not have been endothermic. So this is the last common ancestor for reptiles. The last common ancestor for mammals and the last common ancestor of amphibians and mammals here. So birds are endotherms, but that's a derived trait. That's something new that they developed since they diverged from the common ancestor of mammals. So birds and mammals evolved endothermy independently from each other. All right, why are dinosaurs more closely related to birds than to crocodiles or lizards then? Well, because dinosaurs and birds share a most recent, a more recent common ancestor. All right, use the phylogeny below. Is Protista a clade? No, because not all descendants from a common ancestor are included in the group. It, animals, fungi, and plants would have to be part of that group as well. All right, what are the strengths of phylo, a phylogenetic? Oh, sorry, what are the strengths of a phylogenetics approach over a more traditional approach to phylogeny? Well, phylogenetics, with its emphasis on classifying organisms based on shared derived traits, can demonstrate evolutionary relationships. For example, extrafloral nectaries protect plants. 
An extra floral nectar nectary is a plant structure that's arisen independently more than 100 times in plant evolution. Ants and wasps are attracted to the sugary nectar, and so attracting them helps to protect the plant from herbivores. Here's another one. Um, protection rackets increase speci speciation. Researchers analyzed rates of speciation in six different plant lineages. Plants with extra floral nectaries showed higher rates of speciation compared to plants without them, suggesting a role in the evolution of new plant species. In this graph, sorry, this graph has extra floral nectaries on the x-axis, whether they're absent or present, and the y-axis is the diversi diversification rate or the net speciation events per million years. And we see in plants that don't have extra floral nectaries, they're getting about 0 0.1 speciation events per million year. But when those nectaries are present, the speciation rate is almost 0 0.25. It's more than double the number of speciation events that occur. All right, so at this point, you should be able to demonstrate an understanding of the tree of life as a scientific hypothesis, accounting for the development and evolution of life on Earth. You should be able to describe spontaneous generation and biogenesis. You should be able to explore, explain the experiments of historical significance in supporting spontaneous generation and biogenesis. And you should be able to list three methods used to distinguish one species from another. In addition, you should be able to demonstrate an understanding of classification and the evolution of organisms. List the domains of organisms. You should be able to classify organisms into the correct kingdoms for each domain. Describe a scientific method for naming organisms. Explain the difference between taxonomy and phylogeny and distinguish major characteristics of the members of three domains. All right, as always, any questions you have, please bring them to class or to student office hours so we can discuss them.